Dr. Adam Anderson comes to us from Harvard University, where he presented a dissertation called, entitled The Old Assyrian Social Network and Analysis Based on a Text from Kanesh, 1950 to 1750 BCE. Um, he is currently a Mellon postdoctoral fellow in the Digital Humanities here at UC Berkeley. And uh, he's been working on a number of projects related to social networks. And so um, if there's a little time after his talk, then we can do a live demo of, of a related project that he's also working on. So mm -hmm. thank, thank you, Adam. And thank you. Thank you, Nico. It's exciting to be here. I'm so glad to be able to talk with fellow archaeologists. Uh, I think that most of you will probably be familiar already with a lot of what I'll talk about. Uh, Kultepe Kanesh, it's, it's a, a fairly well-known site nowadays. But uh, I hope to show kind of a process of how we go from uh, some of the most challenging aspects of archaeology, that being unprovenanced artifacts and unknown locations, to more statistical and, and close controlled recontextualizations of, of these um, archaeological data sets. So the primary sources I work with uh, come from one peripheral Bronze Age site known as Kultepe um, in Turkey, which initially yielded more than 5,000 unprovenanced Cappadocian tablets. The majority of these were sold in bazaars and collected by Western museums before World War II. And after decades of textual scholarship by a small group of international scholars, uh, which my work has benefited from, uh, I focused on situating these texts in a reconstructed social uh, and geographical setting, that, which can be analyzed and described using network analysis and other computational methods. Archaeology in the Middle East or in the Near East, is, as it's known for uh, seriologists, has long and illustrious history with more than 150 years of scholarship. From the 1840s onward, Western archaeologists like Sir, Le Sir Austin Henry Layard made early discoveries of textual and uh, material artifacts in the heart, from the heart of Mesopotamia, and awoke a deep curiosity in deciphering the beginnings of human history. Unfortunately, these discoveries inadvertently incentivized a significant amount of looting in the area, uh, which resulted in thousands of unprovenanced artifacts. When we walk through the museums, the British Museum and the Louvre and the Met, we notice it, right? I mean, it's something that we notice while at the same time not noticing. <laughs> um, and uh, so the same, the same goes for, for this site. And the, the, the first horde of texts that were found came from locals. Um, so beginning in the 19th century, uh, common era, a number of cuneiform tablets emerged in these antiquities markets, uh, uh, first appearing in the bazaars and eventually reaching the major museums of Europe and America. Um, Professor Archibald Henry Sace, the curator of the British Museum, uh, reported one such discovery. He, he wrote, quote, in 1881, Dr. Pinches drew attention to two cuneiform tablets, one in the British Museum and the other in the Louvre, as they were said to come from Kaiseri. He proposed for them the name Cappadocian, just before the war, 1,200 1, tablets, mostly in a perfect condition, were discovered by the peasants, 800 of which were seized by the Turkish government, but the rest found their way um, into the hands of dealers. Some of them came to Paris and were bought by the Baudelaire Library and Ashmolean Museum at Oxford, as well as by myself. What has become of the others I have failed to learn. So, so we see that, of course, a lot of these collections ended up in private collections as well as museums. Since that initial discovery, more than 5,000 uh, unprovenanced Cappadocian tablets were collected by these museums. And after deciphering the script, they were able to determine that the these are the remains of an intricate Assyrian trade network from... Um, 
which dated back to 1950 um, BCE. After the war, Turkish archaeologists were able to resume excavations at the site from 1948 onward. However, due to the dislocated process involved in the preservation and curation of the tablets, uh, it has been extremely difficult to reestablish the location of these initial 5,000 at the site, in particular the rooms in which these archives were kept within the private houses. Uh, so, for example, one such account from the director of the excavation uh, during, from 1948 until quite recently, 2000, Taksin Uzguc wrote in his field reports, the, an archive of 947 tablets and, unpro and unopened envelopes and pottery was found in two small rooms. They were evidently kept on wooden shelves against the walls. The tablets were found on the floor along the walls, uh, or were those that fell off the shelves in the fire. The tablets had been packed in bags, in straw wrappings, and, and sacks were discovered in piles at the middle of the rooms. A group of the tablets, as usual, were kept in pots. Pottery was set along the base of the walls. Uh, next to the hearth uh, were found unbaked tablets, evidently left dry or prepared to be fired. So that's, that's all we have in terms of the real documentation. Nine, a number, 947 tablets from a you know, kind of general area where we know they're excavating from the other artifacts that came at the time. Unfortunately, there are no further details as to the tablet numbers, museum numbers that were given to these tablets once they were pulled from the ground, away, moved away from the site, and then uh, located in the museum, uh, or anything that would help us link the individual tablets to the rooms which they were found. For example, a house plan number, or a grid coordinate, or a locus, or some kind of stratigraphy. They'll, they'll dis distinguish general stratigraphy from different periods in time in the site, but, but nothing very close, um, unfortunately. So what their ex excavation reports do tell us are the few published details about the clues of the uh, Assyrian filing system. Uh, so and that the, in particular, these tablets were located um, on the floor above what appeared to be with something above appearing to have looked like broken shelving. And we know from other ancient Mesopotamian sites like Sippar that we find shelving like this and um, there, there could be some similarity drawn. This, in fact, is, is a door in the, from the Ankara Museum and they, they still seal the tablet room. They literally seal it. They'll break it open, cut it open each day and then at the end of the day, they'll bring it together and press together some ceiling over these wires, exactly as the Assyrians described their archive rooms as well, sealed in the same way, funny enough. Um, so, and then where they also kept these tablets in, in pots uh, and sometimes f um, baked in the hearth. Naturally, what little, we're told, only raises more questions. So how did um, each merchant file their tablets? Because this isn't, this isn't an administrative center. These are private merchants, so focused on long distance trade. Each of them had uh, their own kind of writing style to a certain degree, and we can see that in the text. Their hand is evident rather than um, a scribal tradition that we find in southern Mesopotamia and Sumer. Um, and do we see any consistent practices within the colony, either from the Assyrian or Anatolian households? And that's, that's another thing that, we, that this group of texts it helps us to understand, is um, that it's, it's clear from 1948 onward that the excavations have Ha, and the, the archaeologists have kind of pointed to different types of households uh, that have yielded different types of artifacts. And these types happen to be either Assyrian, which makes up the majority of the site. Sorry, this is blurry, but this is maybe a little clear. Um, Assyrian with like scattered in, in between here, 
uh, Anatolian houses as well, or so-called Anatolian houses. Um, now, of course, the cultural ramifications of all of this is lost very often because we, it, we're working so late in antiquity. Um, but from the text, we've been able to note that at least going off of naming practices, which isn't a surefire way to distinguish uh, cultural um, or eth ethnic background, but at least using naming practices, we can identify four distinct Anatolian naming types. So we find Hurian, Hittite, Hatti, and Luvian names. Uh, and these, these names come in somewhat of like uh, clusters in the site as well, with the large majority being Assyrian names. So with what little I could use from the archeological side of things, the plans and the field reports, um, I then focused on the relationships between the families as they were recorded in the texts. And um, that, that in and of itself is, was uh, what kind of took up the bulk of my research um, when I was working on this for the, um, two years ago. On the basis of close readings, it was clear that the initial 5,000 tablets uh, discovered before Turkish excavations came from one general region, this region at the site of Kultepe. And after making a composite map of the published texts and comparing the houses with the descriptions and what little was known from the excavation reports, we could begin to reconstruct the extensive lists of persons and family trees, which, uh, the, which were conveyed through the texts by um, aggregating mentions of the same individuals across uh, these 6,000 tablets, basically. And what initially came, became quite clear, looking, focusing on this side at least, uh, was the real um, prominence of the merchants that were living here. Uh, and I'll explain kind of how I could make a claim like that uh, in a minute. But um, at least from the texts themselves, I could, we've all been able collectively through for the last like 50 years to start to establish family trees that extend across six generations. And, um, and by linking the, the certain archives back to the room numbers where they were presumably excavated, we can then hypo hypo hypothesize a, a certain number of generations that, that may have lived in the house. So Pushu Ken is unambiguously mentioned more than any other merchant, about 450 uh, times across these texts. Um, and from the networks that I've reconstructed, it's clear that his ties run deep in many directions and ex extending into the Assyrian royal families as well. So indicated by letters to the king and the sons of the king, the, the prince, the rubatum, and branching into the far reaches of the Bronze Age market in, in the distant hubs of Anatolia. Where he lived at least part of the time in his life, he died in, or at least uh, he may have died in Durhumit, which is an un, kind of unknown location, still being uh, trying to be determined by a combination of texts and archaeological practices. So no doubt because of this merchant's high profile, he was privy to a broader perspective and his advantage as a leader in the trade also extended to his children. From his oldest son, Buzazu, uh, to his youngest daughter, Ahaha, who was uh, a gubabtum, a type of priestess uh, in Ashur. She, uh, she was afforded a house of her own that she was maintaining for the family there and they frequently write letters back and forth. So she's a thousand kilometers distant from this site, and yet here in the archive, very, pre very present and involved, especially at these critical moments of death and lawsuits, the, the lawsuits that ensue when a wealthy merchant, an established merchant dies. 
because all the creditors come in all of a sudden and want to make sure they get there. Um, so, so it's very clear that these family trees are, are evident from, from the text and that they kind of compiled uh, private dossiers, what we can call them. Archives is maybe a little too grandiose a word for these. Um, unfortunately, we have no foolproof way of knowing the extent to which the, our, these dossiers came together collectively into an archive because, again, this, these are unprovenance texts. These were just pulled from the ground. Um, nor can we easily establish the boundaries of this archive between himself and his children, uh, knowing in particular that his son, Buzazu, uh, had a house of his own um, as well in, a, in another location. So there are a number of questions about how these texts came to be at this site, and if there are other texts at other sites that could give us more details into this co trade colony. But um, from what we can see, they're copying these tablets and they're sending copies of these tablets back to the capital and keeping a copy locally as well. Okay. So that's, that's uh, one major family at the site. And the second is that of Imdi Elum. So he was clearly a wealthy creditor and kind of the, the cash flow behind um, the network. Um, from, from his family tree we have he and his daughter who are present in, uh, in very close quarters, what's being called a neighborhood or a block at least by the archeologist. And she, while she was living here, was married, or he was, sorry, he was married to an Assyrian initially who then p died and, the, and she remarried to an Anatolian. Uh, and named their children a combination of Assy Assyrian and Anatolian names. So that starts to give you uh, the, an, an inkling of the problems we're up against when we're talking about kind of culture, the culture that exists at this site as evidenced from the text, that it's convoluted. Um, but a, a number of these, uh, so these are just like a kind of a initial gist of what we can do with some of these family trees and trying to locate them on a plan that's been georectified. So all of this essentially goes into uh, a place where we can hypothesize where some of these people may have lived as well, based on, as they're, within the text, they're talking about our neighbor so-and-so, and we'll be able to kind of um, provide some geospatial metadata for each of these nodes in the network. Um, but while at the same time, so it allows us to further establish like more extensive family trees as well as this starts to become relational data that we see together. And um, with this, we can start to get a sense of um, a chronological time span. So in demography, they call these you know, cohorts and they're able to date the ages of people or at least how, how long they were active in the network based on these cohort time lifespans. Um, so throughout the process, uh, the social network, which was generated from the texts themselves, serves as a relational control for each name recorded on each tablet, corresponding to the, these six, six generations of families who lived at Kanesh and, and in between Kanesh and Ashur between 1950 and um, 1850 with a re re resurgence around 1750. So most of this that we see here in the network is, is really just 100 years, 80 to be more precise. But then there's a, a smaller group that, of Anatolians that continue after that. Um, such tools allow us to analyze both the familial and the extended relationship, stepping outside the confines of just a family archive, which is really how the field so far has been focused, into the, a more full extent of neighboring cliques and partnerships that extend not just, out, uh, not just within Kanesh, but across um, 
the entire Anatolian plain. Um, so what's important to re reiterate here is that this network is not a simple aggregation. It's not just text as data being forced together, but rather a detailed database that's internally cross-referenced to a number of important attributes. Names of, of the people being a major one, uh, any place names as well, and then a lot of what's taken from the tablets uh, are contextual markers. You'll notice here that there's a cylinder seal. Cylinder seals are a valuable tool for prosopographical studies. And so each of these like components, not just the names, but a lot of, a lot of what's happening on the tablet, as well as what the tablet itself is made of. So we're, we're getting, um, uh, we've been using a PRX scanner, uh, PXRF scanner, sorry, uh, for the, some of the tablets in Ankara to establish perhaps if, or to, to assess whether we can distinguish between clay types coming from local Anatolian clay versus Assyrian clay a thousand kilometers distant. Now, of course, there are other clay sources in Anatolia, uh, as, as um, we can see here. So based on um, the knowledge of the sites that, that these Assyrians are mentioning in their texts, we can show the range of, of villages or cities, if, if you will, um, colonies at least, and outposts, with, within which the most prominent merchants were connected. So Pushuken, as, a, as we mentioned before, by far uh, the most influential. Um, but looking at his influence within his own neighborhood, as well as across the complete network, we're able to see his central position in the network had to do with his ability to forge more numerous relationships on the boundaries of the network. Kind of a Cosmo Medici of his time, in that his ability to, to have this high position in the network was his ability to make, make relationships and contracts with people that extended outside of the, Assyri the regular Assyrian network and gave him access to local networks. Um, so that included wealthy investors at the capital of Asher, but as well as the, the people on the ground who had access to copper mines uh, in Dorhumit, um, up north, most likely. I mean, they're within some range. Um, and so using the computational approaches that networks allow us, we can uh, go through this process of georectifying individuals and their attestation of these place names. And this can help fill in the gaps of what we don't know, where certain places might be based on the push and pull between the social network and the locations that they're mentioning. So, but of course, even with working with a data-driven analysis, we're always making assumptions uh, and interpretations al along with our new discoveries. In working with network models, I've learned how to adopt this structural scaffolding in order to accommodate this kind of like fuzzy nature that we're dealing with when you don't have control on the ground. Using probabilistic distributions with as much granularity and transparency as the text themselves reflect. So again, the, each of these nodes represents a tablet or an entry in a tablet, and all of that is recorded at the level of the artifact, not, not divorced of, from it. So then we're able to show the density of the entire network uh, atomized over the, course of our, over the course of the documentation. And in doing so, we can see the degree to which particular merchants traveled um, across the 40 mentioned place names in the texts. Uh, this, is, this is more of an affiliation or ad, like which, which places were mentioned the most in terms of the heat map on the background. B um, not necessarily with like certainty as to where these places are located. So we're, this is ongoing research, of course, with archaeologists that continue to return to these sites in, in a sense to try to find out where, especially Purush Hadum is. It's, it's a still very um, kind of debatable place. But um, that matters less from the texts as far as the texts are concerned 
there are a certain specific number of times that place has been mentioned. And we can then get a sense of you know, who's going where when, uh, as well as which places appear to be the hubs of the network in terms of the trade that's occurring there for different reasons, of course. There's bronze refineries here and here, copper mines. Kanesh itself was, a, was kind of the portal to a lot of this, what's called you know, this kind of, kind of copper circuit at the time. And then uh, Zalpa probably as like an entry pole. Ashur here then, and, and with a lot of the other materials coming from presumably Iran, Afghanistan, for the tin. And mostly that tin is what's being carried on donkey back over the thousand kilometers to be traded for silver in order to alloy with copper for the Bronze Age. Um, so this can be done then on a large scale as well as a uh, local scale for establishing more proximate provenance. Um, but by fixing these texts that we know came from certain households, uh, we can then probabilistically aggregate those texts with unknown provenance through the social component and other, other mentions of houses and offices and um, contracts, for example, are helpful in that regard. Using the ties that bind them socially, essentially, um, to the neighborhoods from which they came. The results of this work have sparked a new interest in the utility of these ancient texts, especially from archaeologists the, who've largely ignored the texts because of the initial kind of divorce that happens when texts are found in an excavation hurried and sent off to a museum to be numbered and curated rather than contextualized on the site. So I've been working more with Turkish archaeologists on ways to correlate not just the family tree data, but these kind of neighborhoods that are taking shape textually with the private houses and the human remains found in these, um, in the houses. It, this includes, they have a lot of um, teeth samples from humans from different rooms and <clears throat> working with an archaeologist to, who's looking at strontium levels and her theory is that she can see a division between Anatolian and Syrians in the strontium levels. Well, uh, if that's the case, then we, I, I can you know, explain based on who may have been living in the house uh, that she's looking at, whether their names were Assyrian or Anatolian. Not actually anything that the Stone Team level would dictate necessarily, because uh, as, as you saw in some of these family trees, they were intermarrying. <laughs> and so that, that's, it's an interesting question, at least, though, and one that, that piques the curiosity of archaeologists to say, but can, can a data set from the texts inform uh, a method that we're using right now to try to establish who lived in the house. Um, okay. So lastly, it's equally important to me that this process of digitization and online curation or uh, curation through databases uh, attempts to right the wrongs of, of kind of this past that were dealt with in the, in the Middle East and Near East. Rather than ignoring the long colonialist legacy, which has often accompanied archaeology in this region. Today's digital archaeologists can make their data public, contextualizing their history, rather than incentivizing the purchase price of these artifacts. And tablets don't cost much, so it's easy to buy a thousand at a time, as we've seen in the news recently with Hobby Lobby purchasing 5,600 and getting caught again for another thousand. Uh, so, uh, and they're, they're easy to find as well. It's just a matter of going in your backyard and digging them up, I guess, um, if you live in the right place. So by leaving the artifacts where they're found, uh, we can hope for better practices of contextualization through digitization in the future. And that's really like where I feel like um, the work that I'm doing is trying to push that envelope and saying, yes, there are limitations to working with the bull colossi, 
But if you can digitize them <laughs> and if you can print them in 3D, then, then it, it changes the game. And even without 3D printing, we have so many ways of working with the data that, that we can kind of begin to r remove this need of putting our hands on everything. Um, and I think that that's really where a, a field uh, like mine in uh, Assyriology and ancient Near Eastern studies has a chance to shine now because there's no way we're going to get our hands on these uh, in, in anytime soon. <laughs> so um, thank you very much um, for your patience and interest. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to take questions, but I can, I'm can. i also happy to kind of demo the network software a little bit more. I imagine that that's maybe where interests lie, less so in like my Google Earth renditions of these houses, more so in the network analysis and maybe the statistical components of that. Because that's been highly useful in this work, the, using the statistical, statistical measurements of the network to determine you know, who's who in the network and then why they're there. Um, but I'm, I'm also happy to take questions. Um, and we have about 20 minutes, so maybe you could do a demo and then go Okay, cool, on. perfect. Okay, let me mirror my screen, that'll be easier. Oh, did it do it? Show mirroring options in menu bar? No. Mirror displays. There we go. Okay. And I think it's probably. What if I optimize for mine? Yeah, that's better. Okay. Uh, I didn't tell it to close. Shoot. Okay, it's gonna. I'll reopen it. Gephi. I'm using Gephi as like kind of a starting point, and from once you get data into Gephi, you can export it in JSON files and GraphML files into more sophisticated network software like Cytoscape. But but I recommend it, and I I teach it in the classes I'm uh, working with this semester and and last year too. Um, it's open source and it works on any type of computer. Let's see. So I have four different networks here. Um, I'll start actually with, uh, with one that we've been working on. And unfortunately, the visuals are not that great. OK. So within, within Gephi, you have this nice front end visualization tool that's like, you know, useful if you're, if you're getting down into the details and you want to know exactly what w one of these nodes is. So you click on it, and then it gives you the, the data that you've co encoded into the model. But if what you're, I mean, if where you live on, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, <coughs> It's usually in the data table itself, and you're, you're giving attributes to the text that you're working with, let's say. So each of these are um, individuals mentioned in text. We, have, we, have, we assign an ID to a particular person, and we note, in this case, the, d the, the two numbers that correspond to the text. Now, this is work that Nick Feldhaus and I have been working on this semester with the URAP team. So all this data is coming from ORAC, the online corpus of cuneiform uh, literature and texts. Um, so it, we're starting off with texts that have been lemmatized, which, is, which allows us to do something really cool, which is for each individual, we can say what their role is in the text and really like 
simplistic terms. These texts are Ur 3 texts, so from, they date from 2100 to 2004 BC, about 50 to 100 years before the old, old Assyrian texts, um, or the old Assyrian kind of texts were written. Um, and so there's really just like a 50 year gap between these two, which made it a really interesting data set for me to work on subsequently. Um, so with, within, so aside from what we can pull from the text themselves, including the role, and if there's a profession that's mentioned, that, you know, the different texts that, this, that these people are mentioned in, and then the years that, that are joined when we join texts together, you notice that there are a couple of other um, statistical measurements that were generated called authority, hub, um, and eigenvector centrality. There are a number of others. Uh, these are like eigenvalues. Eigenvalues are essentially the yin and the yang of the network. So if you think about a social network, uh, you have people that you point to, like say, let's say people that you tend to write emails to, and you have people who tend to write emails to you. So there's a, there's a directionality that occurs within every network. Uh, and this directionality is really valuable for telling us who's who in the network. So if I'm the type of person who only, who only rarely writes an email, <laughs> but I receive emails constantly, you know, then I would be someone who's considered in the know. In the know is, is equivalent to the um, hub. Uh, so, um, and, in, and then the inverse of that would be an authority, someone writing and telling people do this and that. Uh, eigenvector centrality has to do with the quote unquote leader. So it's a leader metric. It's, it's someone who doesn't necessarily have a lot of ties or relationships to other people, maybe fewer relationships to others, but those relationships that they do have are with people who have very many relationships to others. If you think of like the CEO around a table, is the per he has he can he talks to maybe seven people, but those seven people are talking each to like hundreds of people probably. So that's that that CEO would have a very high eigenvector. So so these are statistics that can be measured um, very easily within this setting. Once you've given the the properties of the network based on these types of the yin and the yang, the pull, the push and the pull, Rece who's receiving something, who is sending something, well, who is the source of something being sent. All of that was documented on these texts. And just those three categories, who's receiving, who's sending, and who's the source, will tell us immediately uh, a lot about the um, statistics of the network. So you can come in and, you know, like run, run these, it's, it's just a run button. Average clustering coefficient, eigenvector centrality, which, you know, of course, is dangerous for someone who doesn't actually know what these algorithms do. But the nice thing is, is that it's contextualized right here in, your, in front of you. And then you can come to this place in the appearance and look at, let's say, in the appearance tab, we'll look at the size. Let's make the size based on the rank of, of um, eigenvector, eigenvector centrality, with the minimum being 10 and the maximum, let's make it 50. And then the, the network prop changes its property and you can begin to see, so let's do that same thing for color now and choose the same measurement. Let's see, maybe if I turn it to white, it would be more visible. And we can then see, okay, so it's not, so it's Shulgi, Irimu, Nalu, Aradmu to some degree, but he's really the leader of this. Now let's, let's take a look at this guy, Shulgi, Irimu, and let's look at, okay, so we don't have any profession. We don't have any profession listed on the texts. So if you're just close reading these texts, you wouldn't know just innately who he was. He doesn't declare who he is. But if you look at the, his role, he's every time recipient. In every instance, in all the texts that were joined together, 
he's, he's the recipient of the goods being traded here in this colony. So that tells you something. Eigenvector centrality is equivalent to recipient. Okay. I mean, it's, this is like really basic, and of course, this is all has to be contextualized more, but let's, let's do it again. Let's look then at, go back to size and change it to the hub and apply that. And all of a sudden, it changes properties entirely. Okay, so it's, let's look here and see. Ah, this guy. And it, we have to probably change the text size too. Um, okay, and now it's, it looks like a totally different network. And we see Abhishaga. Abhishaga's profession, again, he doesn't list anything, but the role that he occupies, again, almost every time, except with a few recipients, he's the source. He's the source of these things. Of the, and these things are mostly animals. Dream texts, this is the Dream archive which are mostly like animals being traded in, in a peripheral place on the Sumerian uh, kind of um, or three administrative state uh, at the time, city state. Um, so the nice thing is that you can then go in and textually understand why he's the hub. What is this statistic actually telling me, but contextualizing it by the texts? That, that's really helpful because otherwise, how do you teach eigenvector centrality? Well, you do it through linear algebra, you know, but who's, who's going to take a class on linear algebra to learn what eigenvector centrality is? I mean, I don't see any hands popping up. Um, so instead, we can teach it through a more hands-on place that actually gets them rooted in what's happening um, with context that they're already interested in. So let's change it one last time to this authority metric. And we see again the network changes entirely. It's now we're looking at Aradmu. With Shugi Irimu, who is the leader, being, being like a prominent node, but no, not nowhere near as much as Aradmu. And here again, no profession. So these are people who are just assumed, they're, they're just assumed that they're leaders because they don't have to put their title down. Uh, and, and the texts are pretty clear that they have these places. And then we look, and in almost every instance, he's the represent, he's the via, via. So something's taken by this guy to, from the source to the recipient. And he's the representative. Um, now, this is, it's, it's pretty cool to um, have this kind of control over 15,000 Sumerian tablets. Like, this is the aggregation of the tablets. And, and then to be able to jump into the back and say, OK, well, which texts are we talking about here? And then, you know, to like click on it and drop this into the online data, database. I mean, it's, it's immediate, and you can be working with the texts at the same time very easily. And all of this is open source, and it, it works just by importing spreadsheets, you know. So, so there's not a huge hurdle to, to, to enter into this realm, if, if you dare, right? Because it's always about the, the trick of it isn't necessarily what we're looking at now. This is what's called the nodes list. This is the data that each node uh, carries with it, and the metadata. The, the trick of it, of course, is the edges. Network analysis measures relationships, not just data points, like most, of, most databases, but the relationship between data points. And so we're, we're going to we're assign each node uh, an ID, and that ID is used as either a source or a target. And that's, that's the explicit relationship. It's directed. And then that edge is given an ID and it's given a weight. That's the important part. That gives it that kind of structural push and pull in the network. Uh, and then here we, we also provide the years that were, are tested for this edge and the text in some cases. 
So that's, that's one example, and I think like a, a real prime example, one that we worked on recently, there's of course others. This is the old Assyrian network. Um, it's, it's still being disambiguated like by, by hand uh, because there's so much poponymy uh, within this text. So there's so many people using the same name over the six generations, and that we have a grandfather who, who will name a grandchild his name before he dies, or maybe as he dies, the parents name him that. And it's, it's mostly, it mostly happens through the male line, but there are a few examples of females named after their grandfathers. And, and then you get poponymy happening across genders. Um, the cool thing when running the statistics here in comparison is that instead of the source and the authority and the hub being three separate people, they collapse. Two of them collapse. Uh, under Pushu Ken and Nimdi Elam, these two people that I talked about earlier in their family trees, one being the wealthy creditor, the other one being the main center of trade. So in, it gives us a way now of like comparing networks that we've never dared ever do before, comparing Sumerian Ur-3 administrative network with this long distance trade network in Ashur. Well, that's risky business. But at least in this way, we can do it from a kind of sound methodology that's been laid forth while still questioning assumptions and interpretations all the while. But it's a structural scaffolding that allows us to kind of see, can we follow this? Can we equate an apple and an orange? You know, what properties do they have similar? Well, their statistic properties are kind of, it's there. Either, you know, they're connected or they're not connected. That's binary. I mean, you can apply a weight to it, but this gives us a way to compare something that the context of which is, is huge, 22,000 nodes versus Dram's, you know, 1,000. Uh, then, you know, jumping into, say, Ebla and the Ebla archive that has been reconstructed and the different shapes that this is taking has to do with the text typologies. This is uh, focused more on the, the text themselves textiles um, and pot, uh, pots and pans and utensils and the different, so there's, there's a kind of this like, yeah, like a leveling effect that takes place because you do have to atomize it all. But because it all takes place um, within the, the nodes list and edge list in the background, there's, there's no like distance between you and your data at any point. Like you get to be the one who's curating it on the back end and playing with it and coloring it on, on the front end. Um, so that, that's really, I think, a helpful tool, especially since a lot of archeology span is done uh, you know, in the privacy of your own office. Uh, and yes, these files are, sh are easy to share as well. And that's the nice thing. Like this, this isn't my work. This is coming from an Italian um, or a seriologist, Massimo Maiocchi, who works with the database and is interested in analyzing it for different kind of structural properties, but um, is more of a text person. So in the end, like that's really, I think, what this and other tools like network analysis and text analysis can do is start to build bridges between archaeologists who work with only with bones and strontium values and philologists who only work with tablets. And neither the twain shall ever meet at the same conference even, unless you can find uh, some relevant way of bringing these two together. And then all of a sudden, both of your data sets have taken on an additional dimension. We're adding new dimensionality to this. Um, so that's kind of the, the argument I make for these types of tools. And I think that if you're looking for more dimensions to your work, it's a great way to go about it in a, a transparent way, one that you're not ending up with like some black box results at the end, but rather something you can control uh, to the nth degree. I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. My so pleasure. Yeah, I'm happy to. Yeah, it's, it's called Gephi. You can see it right there, G-E-P-H-I. It's a dot org. Uh, and so it works on um, all the, it works on all the different types of, um, 
Computers. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Can I go back to your archaeology a bit? You said that these were unprovenance tablets that, that primarily you were working with. Yeah. And yet you had individuals going back to individual rooms. Is that because of what you learned from doing your textual connectivity analysis that you could actually pinpoint room blocks or something like that? But That's you work back. I work backwards. It's working backwards to the archaeology. So we, there were a couple of, so the early archaeologists who came to the site started in the, play, in the place that was looted. So they saw, ah, this is, this is clearly where the tablets have been coming out of the ground. Why don't we just start here? And, and so that's how, in the very initial report in 1948, it's one of the best, actually, that they've ever done, unfortunately. Or fortunately, I mean, you know. Uh, and there they, they were very clear about like what few additional texts can they, and from that first season they pulled. Few ones that helped you link in the That's right. And then, and then it's clear this is the same household because of uh, the continuation of an event like a lawsuit that's unfolding. And then we'll have additional con like records or contracts from that lawsuit that correspond to the thousand uh, or maybe fewer. Uh, that we have unprovenanced and it, circular way back. Yeah, you, uh, um, and it, it, yeah, it's this like backwards engineering. Can we find it this way? In a lot of cases, you you can't. Like that's what the, one of the problems is that there for the old Assyrian stuff, there is a lot floating out here, um, out around here, that is not connected at all to anything. Um, and that will be, that's a continual, continual project, but the fact remains, of the 30,000 texts that have now come from this site, uh, there's more that they could find each season. Like, they're not done with pulling tablets out of the ground. So it could very well be that this chunk over here has just not been excavated yet, and though the names that are in there are unique to us now, but they'll become known to us as they continue to excavate. Or, you know, they are unique names, in which case, like, you can't do anything with that anyway because, so, Moens Larsen, who, who edited one of these archives that was excavated, uh, you know, in situ and, and with proper provenance and, and loci points, turns out that within that archive, that local archive that his family used, there were other people who weren't related to the family that were depositing texts in there. And those people, would sometimes put texts in without any names associated whatsoever. They were just commodities and receipts. Okay, well, what do you do with a receipt that could be from somewhere else? Well, you do PXRF and you say, where did the tablet come from, maybe? Or you, you know, but you're limited at some point. So there's always going to be a number of tablets that, that you're just going to have to say, we think it came from here, but we don't know where, and we definitely won't try go to putting it like as a point on the ground with geolocation, but but they're then in these kinds of clusters and maybe typologies of tablets that we could then work with. There's there's like at least 40 types of tablets that they wrote here, 40 different types, and those are ranging from like legal briefs, very formal legal briefs and, and business contracts, all the way to like personal notes and memos and writs of divorce and things like that. So it, it has a full range of the types of texts you, we could then say, okay, well, we've never found a, a writ of divorce in this place before, so, but we, they all seem to be coming from over here at this like, office where marriages and divorces take place. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the display, is it synchronic? Everything is thrown together? Is there, there it is. That, that's right. Yeah, yeah. It's a really good point. Um, so within here, um, I and especially for the the Dream texts, what we're working on. So we just started doing this network, and and the nice thing about the texts from Dream, these fifteen thousand texts that we have from 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 Dream in southern Mesopotamia, Sumerian tablets, is that each one is has a date on it. So every tablet is dated, uh, and sometimes to the day and the month, and the week, and the year, you know? So you get all four in one, and you're like, perfect, you know? I know just when it happened. Uh, so there is a way to do time sequence, uh, and there, there are simple ways, and there are complex ways. The, one, one of them will, will be like kind of a Boolean form, in that you say, like, 
based on which year it displays certain uh, parts of the network. Um, now it's, it's always like incredibly easy to just, you know, create a new network, copy to new workspace, and there I've just, I've just sent this subset that I just randomly selected to a new place, and now it's a subset of the network. So it's very easy from the huge, kind of starting from everything together, to then just piece off, no, I just want a year of it. Let me just take this year, let me control for that, because maybe I want plus or minus five days. Uh, and then I, I can make a network that way as well. So, so there's a lot of variability in terms of like what you see, uh, if that's like how you're working with the network in the visual here. Um, or you can just simply work with it in the data aspect of it behind the scenes and make, make your subsets there. But um, the nice thing is that there are a lot of plugins for Gephi, and these are constantly being updated because it's open source software. So there's a lot of development going on for this tool. And you can go through and see that they have um, you know, good documentation for each of these plugins here uh, that allows you to look at um, scale parts of the graph with a scale factor, minimum spanning tree, calculate minimum spanning trees. Um, you have, um, let's see, the ones that I think were from time I already installed. Let me see here. Yeah, I mean, but they, a lot of the, and they're all documented, like, except for the standard ones, there's some really good descriptions about what these do. So, um, the, the time span one, I'm forgetting the name of it, but it basically gives you this interval metric here. You see timestamp here. Uh, and there's, there, um, there's a timestamp, and then there's an interval one, so that you can, like, give it a range. And then it will display based on that interval if, when you like, do a filter. I mean, that's the other nice thing about this is that it has this really great, like um, you can filter on attributes or any kind of like dynamic variable. Uh, I'm going to start clicking things and it's going to crash because it is open source software. <laughs> it's always the problem with demoing anything. But, uh, but you can see that you can then like create an ego network very easily um, by just dropping that component in here and saying what the parameters of that network are with it within the depth of one, two, three, or max. Um, and you can do that with um, some k-core or uh, an attribute. So let's say a year. So if you have within your data set a column or an attribute called year, then you can filter very, uh, very quickly based on that and export that filter to a new, new workspace. So it's, it's really adaptive and interactive in that regard. Um, so, so yeah, you're right. Like at the time, it's kind of like you see it and it's all like, well, when is this taking place in time? Yeah, and space for that matter. There is this geo layout that allows you to graph it uh, based on geo coordinates that you've put it in x and y values. Um, and it'll read those in as well if you've labeled your headers like x and y or lat long. Um, so they, they work really nicely in that regard with, with what I need for archaeology. Um, but yeah, like kind of getting the, getting filtering down to what you need is, is like, you know, kind of the, always the challenge for everything in my field is because you have so much data. <laughs> well, thanks again.